Hey, grab your Bible out real quick. Open up to 2 Corinthians. Firstly, let me say Merry Christmas, Vive Church. We are well and truly in our Christmas season here at Vive. And next week in particular, I am so excited for our Vive Christmas Creative King. It is going to be an amazing and spectacular Sunday. A Sunday like you've never seen before. A very out-of-the-box creative Sunday. We've let the artists run free. We've, we've taken off the restraints. Usually we keep them locked in a creative box and we say perform within this box. But next Sunday, we've let them out of the box. They've gone all over the world. They've been in different regions. They've even been in desert places recording a, a film that is gonna minister, I believe, and speak some truth into people's lives. And so next Sunday, you need to prepare your heart for next Sunday. Even this Sunday, you need to prepare your heart for next Sunday because next Sunday ain't for you, church. Next Sunday is not for you. Next Sunday is for your family that don't know Jesus. Next Sunday is for your friends that don't know Jesus. Next Sunday is for your co-workers who are yet to find Jesus and they're about to find Jesus. If you would do your job and be the evangelist of Jesus Christ and spread the gospel message through simply inviting people with a link or, or sharing a, a, an Instagram story or just sharing something. So church, I am compelling you this week. Get, 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 don't worry about your profile feed. Don't worry about how neat and nice it looks by your curated images. Would you share an invitation somehow, some way on some feed, whether it be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, some digital platform that God has blessed you with? And just share the love of Jesus Christ by inviting people to our Vive Christmas Creative next Sunday. It's going to be spectacular. But that's next week. Today, I feel God's got something for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to go ahead and read from verse 1. It says this, This boasting will do no good, but I must go on. I will reluctantly tell about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up in the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside of my body, but I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. I feel like this is Paul just baiting you to say, Paul, tell us. <laughs> like, like, what was that that you heard? What was that that you saw? He goes on to say that that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weaknesses. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth, but I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time He said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. My goodness, what a passage of Scripture. You know, as we draw close, closer to the end of 2020 in true 2020 fashion today because it's raining outside, we have pivoted back to the warehouse coming to you online with the Amen Army in here. And, and so whether, whether outside or inside, whether in the flesh or in the spirit today, in the fashion that Paul speaks, I believe that God has something very, very specific for this particular Sunday, almost like at the beginning of time, He crafted this Sunday to speak a word just for you. So I want you to prepare your hearts as if God is going to speak right into your life, right into your living room, like God is going to speak right through your device today, as if God could wire it just so that this device would be planned in such a way that no matter what was going on in the world, God's Word would get directly to you today. And I do believe He's going to speak. So let me give you the title of this message. Are you ready for it? The title of the message is, Let the Weak Speak. Let the Weak Speak. Speak. Go ahead and put my title in the chat for all those that are slow to service and coming late and they can look back through the chat feed. Let the weak speak. And maybe we'll just see what God's going to speak to us today. Amen. 
Amen. Let me take your seats. If you're at home, go ahead and take the couch, take the bed, take whatever you find yourself around today. Settle in, but lean in. Settle in, but 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 make sure you lean in today. So we've been going through a, a situation in the Smallcomb household of I've worship. It's a plumbing situation, Brendan. We've been we've been going through a plumbing situation. There's something going on in our household, a little funky. There is a there, there is what, how can I put this? There's an odor. There, there's, there's an odor that's happening in our house. It's a sewer smell. And uh, it's been happening for the last eight weeks. Like for eight long weeks, we have endured with a, with a sewer issue in our home. And, and I've been working hard. And I've got to tell you, nothing defeats me in life like plumbing. I don't know what it could be. Like, like I, I, I consider myself a handy guy. I, I consider myself with some basic skills, like some dad skills. You know what I mean? It's not like, not like I'm a professional spooner. Not like I've, I've like, you know, I've, I've gone to school for all this stuff, but just dad skills, you know, just like just general dad skills because I'm the guy. I got a household full of women. Who else is going to kill the spiders? Who else is going to get rid of the possums that my dog kills? Who else is going to fix the issues that come in the house. That's my job. I'm dad. But nothing makes me feel weak like plumbing. Like plumbing. Like plumbing. This And this particular plumbing issue has, has got me so defeated. Like, like, and it's not just me. Like if I, it would be okay. It would be one thing to be defeated if, you know, you could just call the plumber and the plumber comes and says, hey, it's just this, fixes it. And you just go, oh, well, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Like it was just, a, you know, I didn't flush the toilet or something, you know, that then you would understand. But the truth is I've had four professional plumbers come and all four of them can't figure out what the issue is. That makes me feel a little bit better, but still I've got a problem. Like four times. I mean, we've, we've been through every plumbing possibility in our house. We've, we, we've even had cameras go down through the plumbing and everything looks A-OK. They've given me the little recording of the film that they take. Through. Like, what am I going to do with that? Like it's like a little added, like added bonus to getting your plumbing a camera down. They give you the little memory card and they say, hey, just in case you want to watch this back. Just in case you want to, like, just watch back, you're bored. You know, you've run out of Netflix in 2020, you need something to watch. Like, hey, why don't you watch the camera go through your, your sewer system? That's fun. But we've looked at everything. We've, we've, even one plumber said, oh, it's probably something dead in your roof. It was that bad. They're like, oh, something, something died in here. You know, you know it's bad when they say, you know it's bad. You know how bad a plumbing situation is when a plumber comes and goes, oh, that's bad. Because you know that plumber has, they've seen some bad stuff. You know, this, I mean, you know, when it's a veteran plumber and the veteran plumber, the whole time he's like, wow, man, this is bad. This is bad. This, this. And you're like, yeah, I know it's bad. They're like, there's something dead in your roof. There has to be something. I've, I've been through, I have been in places in my home I never even knew existed. I didn't even know I had a trap door in my house that you could lift up. Like all of a sudden the carpet comes away. I'm like, has that been there the whole time? (laughs) Getting under there and looking for dead things. That was fun. In the crawl space in the roof, I have scoured every inch. There ain't nothing dead. And out of all of this, it feels like like I'm feeling feeling pretty weak. (laughs) I'm feeling pretty defeated. However, something I learned a long time ago, and even right now as I'm preaching this, I'm feeling a little bit better because I discovered a long time ago, you've got a skill, Gabe, as a preacher, that when you go through bad stuff, if you turn it into an illustration, it makes you feel a little bit better. You know, it puts a little bit of purpose to the pain that you're going through, and now I've got something to share with y'all, and my life's a mess. That feels better. Feels better. I mean, people pay a lot of money for therapy, and just to say that. Just to tell someone in confidence that they're a mess. I'm a mess, everyone. I feel weak. Now I feel like I feel a little bit better, honey. I feel a bit better about this, this plumbing issue. It doesn't take the sting out of it, but somehow it puts, puts all of this weakness to work, which is essentially what Paul is doing here in this passage where he reveals that as an apostle, he's no stranger to trials. 
Paul was not backward about coming forward with his own struggles. In fact, one of the most unique characteristics about Paul's ministry was his transparency or, or even better still, his vulnerability with regards to hardships when it came and to enduring things for the sake of his, his calling. And whether he was penning letters from prison or, or whether he was drawing illustrations from his own personal pain, what Paul would openly do is he would openly admit that by simply being a Christian, it doesn't um, what's the word? It doesn't protect you from problems. But by just simply being a believer, it doesn't mean that you are protected or you have some force field. I know the power of God is strong. I know that the mighty power of God works for you. But please, Paul wants you to know, do not be disillusioned. But, but by signing up to follow Jesus does now not make you impervious to problems in life. And if a preacher ever presents that to you and that's the reason you signed up, that is a false doctrine as far as Paul is concerned. Because one thing you can be guaranteed of in life, in fact, what Paul takes a lot of emphasis to reveal is what you can expect in this life is hardships. The Bible's emphatic about it. The Bible is emphatic in its expression or its expectation around the idea of trials and trying times. Like Reuben, we're going to go through trials. Like we're going to go through trials. The, the Bible is not backward about it. The Bible doesn't just hide it. The Bible doesn't just kind of even sneak it in there. In fact, you'll be shocked to see how much of the Bible talks about trials over it does blessings. It's fascinating. It's fascinating what we focus on. And truthfully, there is, there, there is no more, this is no more evident, the idea of trials, the idea of Christian hardship, I think ever in the history of humanity than what we have been through this year because all of us, I mean, I, there's some Christmas seasons you can preach a, a message about hardship and you can be pretty sure that at least 50% of your congregation have been through some hardship. Like you, there are different seasons in life where you can preach about struggles and you can be pretty sure that 50 to 70% of people are currently in a struggle. Hardly ever in history have you been able to preach like a year like 2020 and just know that I'm talking about struggles, everyone's saying amen. Whether it's on the outside or the inside, everybody's like, oh, preach it, pastor. But like right now, it is, it is super evident, like so evident that there is hardships in life. I mean, even these Christmas carols that we're singing today, fine job, by the way, Vive Worship, but, but these Christmas carols that we sung today seem to have words I've never noticed before. <laughs> Did you notice that? It's like, it's like, like Vive Worship just snuck in some lyrics, but they didn't. Like, oh, holy night. They're the same lyrics that Mariah Carey sang. <laughs> Very same ones. Like, like, have you ever noticed where it said, a weary world rejoices? Like, I, I've sung that so many times. We used to even, we used to do carols by candlelight out in the park. Remember that, babe? When, when we just started dating, it was all cute. And we'd do the Christmas carols outdoors. And man, nothing weary about my life back then. It was great. <laughs> just forget the weary, just rejoice. That's what what I was all about, but I just didn't notice. I thought maybe five worship snuck in weary. Like, like, like weary just snuck in there, which, which, which is funny how that word is emphasized to me in this season. I, I, wonder, if, I wonder if it has something to do with the way we feel. Like it puts, I, when I was thinking about this, it puts so much emphasis to what we've been walking through. It, it puts so much emphasis behind the way we've been walking out life and probably where we've ended up right now at the end of 2020 after battling through things, after being able to pivot, all the pivots that we've had to walk through through, through, through 2020. I'm talking about, I'm wondering if anybody feels weary is what I'm trying to say. I'm wondering if anybody's just worn out having to constantly pivot and, and change their plans. I'm wondering if anybody's tired from, from the media's agenda narrative. I'm wondering if anyone's fatigued from frustration and fear and uncertainty, this, this idea that we're, we're, we're weary, and yet the Christmas carol suggests that in the midst of weariness, yeah. rejoice. How? Because to me, two things don't generally go together. How can we rejoice when we're weary? How do we rejoice when life is tough? 
Like the idea of rejoicing to me requires some enthusiasm and some energy and something to rejoice in. But when I'm weary, it doesn't seem like I've got a lot of energy to rejoice. Do I have a real amen on me here? How do we, how do we rejoice when we're weary? Well, I want to suggest that it's exactly the same the way Paul says, boast in weakness. You see, something you need to know about Paul is that he didn't just have hardships. Paul also had haters. <laughs> you, you, you thought 2020 was hard without any critics. Paul went through 2020 and with critics. Paul had, Paul had hardships and Paul had haters. In fact, growing up, we didn't even, we we're talking about this just last night. We didn't have a, a word that so accurately descriptive enemies, you know what I mean, or, or people who are jealous of you. Now, now this new generation, what do we call them, Vox Genus, they, 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 call them, they call them haters, like haters, man. And it's funny how, how this generation uses haters, you know, it's like that they're not really a hater, they're just sad about their own life, and that's why they're commenting on yours. But, 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 but ultimately, I feel like what Paul had, Paul actually had people who hated him, like wanted him dead, okay? And so this is what Paul had against him, like real life Haters, however, much of what Paul is writing here in this passage to the church in Corinth is actually a defense argument against the rivals in his world, so to speak. A group of men that were trying to take advantage of, of what Paul had previously established in building the church, and they were just going to swoop on in and, and establish their dominance based off their brilliance. And, and I wonder if you ever had haters. Have, have you ever had people who, who, who maybe, maybe, maybe they are just anonymous Instagram commenters, you know, maybe, maybe they're just, they're people that are just ultimately trying to disrupt your life or, or do something like that. Well, Paul would tell you that the presence of haters or rivals or opposition or whatever you want to call it in your life is actually an indicator of influence or something that God is setting up for you to do in your life. That's how Paul would present it. Paul was aware that he had haters, but yet at the same time, he was aware of what the presence of haters means in your life. At the same time, equally, the lack of these people in your world also reveals something. Like if you're just walking through life right now and everything's rosy, like nobody hates you, everybody loves you, then I want you to go ahead and read your Bible and see what Jesus said. He said, people will despise you for my name's sake. So, so if people aren't despising you, then maybe they don't know anything about Jesus that you have in your life because it said, he said, it's not you they hate, but it's me. So rest assured that when you have people persecuting you, you're doing something right. You're doing something well. You're actually doing the thing you're meant to do. You're actually meant to be on that path. You're meant to have some opposition. Now, please do not get this squirrely and misunderstood that you just have to go and cause trouble. Make sure it's for the name of Jesus. Make sure it's actually with good theology. Make sure it's from the Holy Spirit. Make sure that it's in line with honoring God and living out His purpose, not just trying to stir up strife and trouble. As, as Peter says, don't, don't do it for being a thief. <laughs> You can't be a thief, you can't be a liar, you can't be a, 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 a persecutor of people and then say, well, if people hate me, that's just for the Jesus. No, 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 it's not for the Lord Jesus. That was for you. But, but there is this understanding that in life, what Paul had is, Paul had haters and Paul had people opposing him, which was a confirmation that I'm doing what I'm meant to do. However, what Paul understood is that these men were challenging his apostleship by presenting a case to the Corinthians that included their impressive revelations, their, their spiritual experiences, their, their scriptural insights, and even their own heavenly visions in an attempt to not only present themselves as more superior to Paul, but to also discredit him by the way of his obvious struggles. What they emphasized is like, check out this Paul who struggles. <laughs> Check out Paul. Like, here's Paul again in prison. Here's Paul again, like, with another ailment. Here's Paul again in trouble. Like, here's Paul. You know, as, as for these other super apostles never having a problem in their life, having favor with men, having favor with leadership of the city, having favor with leadership in every circle that they found themselves in, just walking in favor and blessing how holy they must be. Yeah, yeah. Check out Paul. Paul got, Paul got problems. 
And it's funny because I feel like that's like actually often the way we, we process struggles too. And I feel like this is no more evident than through the way that we pray. Like, like if we were just to do a self-analysis for a moment, a self-survey, just for a moment, right there from your bedroom, right there from your living room, just there on your own, just you and the Holy Spirit, I wonder how much of our prayer life is motivated around God doing something for us or helping us avoid something. Like, 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 like our prayer life is all about God, avoid, help me avoid this situation, God, help me avoid any, help me avoid things. And, and I'm not saying don't pray for those things. In fact, man, I, I, we, I remember our first ever, one of our first ever leadership roles that we got to experience as a married couple. Babe, you'd remember this. At our Park Avenue house, we had like a little, we just got our brand new little Park Avenue house. It was a duplex. And uh, we had a little little set up and we were loving life in the duplex of Park Avenue. Do not be intimidated by the word Park Avenue. It wasn't fancy. There was a train track right behind us and uh, the whole house would rattle every time we would, it would go past. But, but at Park Avenue, we held our first leadership couple ministry, which was a, a home group, I think we called it back then, like a midweek. And uh, we had a home group. And, and I remember we, we were just so pumped about starting this home group. And, and we went all out. Like we, we had hospitality down. I had a, I had a whole thing prepared. We're going to go through Romans 8. <laughs> like, yeah, you're at the right home group, man. We, uh, we, we ain't fooling around with just some of the lighter stuff. We're going right to the meat of the word. We're going to deep dive. That's what we're going to do. And, and, and I remember setting it up and nobody came. Like nobody came. I obviously thought it was a marketing issue. And so we thought, you know, maybe we're going to communicate this out there. This is, this is like pre-stuff, you know, this ain't this pre-social media kind of stuff. So, you know, we went and did a little letterbox drop around the neighborhood. We got the church directory. This is when you would get a printing of the church directory, all the people from the church, and we'd start calling people. You in a midweek? I mean, you in a, it was a home church? Yeah, you happy there? <laughs> uh, you know, we, we would start, you were trying to build things, you know what I mean? And I remember the next week we set it all up, invited people, and nobody came. I mean, like for three weeks, nobody, nobody came. But then finally our neighbor came. And, and then the next neighbor, we had, we, we had nobody from church come. We had all our neighbors come into a Bible study completely unaware. We, just, we didn't tell them it was a Bible study. We didn't tell them it was a home group. We said we're just putting food on like a neighborhood, like, you know, like, a, like a party. And they turn up and then we just spring it on them. You know what I mean? And, and I remember this one lady that came in, she came in hobbling. You know, she had the, the knee thing and she came in hobbling. I said, fantastic, we're going to get a healing tonight. This is, this is going to be amazing. And, uh, and I was talking about, I just pivoted in the moment. I pivoted and I started preaching about healing. I just started preaching about the power of God, Brandon. I just started, I said, come on, we're going to pray for some people. Anybody got an issue? Like anybody got anything, anybody, anybody here having difficulty being mobile in life? Nothing. And then I look at her in the eyes. Anybody got any form of pain at all? Nothing. I end up going over to say, hey, I notice there's a bandage on your knee and you're hobbling in here. Would you like me to pray for that? To which she replied, No. I didn't learn that in Bible college when they say no. I said, why not? And she said, well, if my knee is bad, that means God's will is that I'm in pain. That's what she said, right? You were there. That God must want me to be in pain. Now, this wasn't a thought through response, but it was just the Holy Spirit in the moment. I said, how do you know? Like, how do you know? Unless you pray. I'm not saying that my prayer is going to work. I'm not saying that my prayer is going to heal it. But you've still got to pray to find out if the healing is what God wants or not. In fact, this is what Paul prayed. Paul said this in verse 9. He said, I prayed three times that this thorn in my flesh would go away. Paul's like, I prayed three times. Three times. He didn't just try once. 
He's like, man, I prayed and that didn't work. You know, he's not going to just resolve. Maybe I prayed wrong. So he prays again and he prays again. Three times Paul said, I prayed, but three times God gave me an answer that my grace is all that you need. God revealed something deeper through the, the prayer. Instead of just praying, God, I want to avoid any pain in my life. God, I want to avoid situations. God, would you keep me free from any hardships? Why don't you just go ahead and God, God, God I'm going to believe that you have a great path for me. God, I believe that there are things you have in store for me. But God, whatever I go through, God, I pray that your grace would sustain me. God, I pray that whatever I go through, God, that you would show me something. God, I pray that whatever I go through in life, Lord, let me not be ignorant to miss out on the lesson of what that could serve to build my life. But God, would you have your way and reveal something deeper. Reveal something deeper. And Paul puts it this way. He said, instead of boasting about the amazing things he could boast about, he says, I will only boast about my weaknesses. I mean, why would you do that? Why would, why would you only boast about your weaknesses? Surely you could pepper it with some of the blessings. <laughs> do you mean surely you could just tuck in a few little... A few little blessings in there. And by the way, I struggled with the plumbing, but you should see me build a deck, man. (laughs) Why would you only boast about weaknesses, especially when you have such impressive competition coming at you? Well, Well, maybe Paul knew something that his rivals didn't, like how real strength isn't something that you simply display Real strength is something that is, is developed. In other words, while these jokers were, were flexing on Paul, Paul was way more interested and focused on how hardships and struggle and suffering function with regards to building our faith. He wasn't going to waste time flexing on them with all the great revelations he had. He wasn't going to spend his time talking about the amount of churches that he started. He wasn't going to spend time just boasting about all those good things. He was like, you know what I'm going to focus on? I'm going to focus on the function of my faith being built because there is so much hardship going on. Man, you should see what this is going to produce. In fact, what it's going to produce is going to put everything else to shame that isn't even worth boasting about compared to the glory that's going to come through this struggle. So don't stay back there in that victory. Don't stay back there and that. Look at what God's doing right now. Right now. This is what he reveals in his letter to the Romans. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, he says, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. He's talking about character here. He's talking about the only way to develop character is through a trial. That like anything that's purified or toughened is tested. That there's no way you can have character in life unless you've been through a testing. How would your character be proven unless there's been something to test that character? Talking about endurance, the gift of opposition, the gift of trials to be a testing in this life. And if we're constantly just praying for God to bypass all those things in my life, you keep missing out on the thing that's going to very test your character and prove something, prove the goodness of God. You see, his rivals were so busy boasting about their ability to avoid the trials of life as if suffering is something unspiritual. Like the way that they were boasting is like they've never had to go to prison. They've never had persecution, like as if that, all those things are something unspiritual. And yet this is the mechanism that the enemy will use in your life to delude you from the, from the fact that God is actually working through those things. If he can distract you enough to, to get your focus on a struggling season or a hardship season. Do you know what's been crazy to me is how many churches this year have, have literally seen a pandemic as a personal attack on them? Like on them as a pastor, like this is a personal, like, like, like the whole world is going through something just because you need to be attacked. 
But yet you've missed it by focusing on the attack. You miss what God could be doing and broadening your mind and deepening your understanding and shoring up your foundation in Christ to, to know it's not about the performance of the ministry, but what Christ is ministering to me. So if I would minister out of that, then just maybe it may help somebody. So Paul knew that. Paul saw from a different perspective what they see saw as unspiritual. Paul Paul chose to rejoice even when things got rough. Understanding that the same way resistance built muscle, endurance develops strength. You see, the enemy isn't victorious in your life because of the presence of problems or difficulties. No, the enemy only becomes victorious when your situation silences you. The only way that that the presence of problems, the only way that the presence of trials actually becomes the the tool of of the enemy or a victory for the enemy is when that season silences you. Up until that moment that you stop speaking, it is still in the hands of God. The the, the very thing that is frustrating you, the very thing that is annoying you, the very thing that is irritating you, the very thing that is causing you to just to strive and to push against, it is still in the hands of God. God can still do something with it as long as you don't stay silent. But the moment it silences your voice, you are going to miss what God is doing in the midst of that. The moment you silence your voice, you surrender everything you've been through to the enemy and you say you have the victory. But while you keep speaking, while you keep shouting, while you keep declaring that my God is greater, I will keep presenting everything that God has taken me through and I will give glory to God. The enemy has no victory. It's still in the hands of God. This is what the prophet, and I believe, I believe, I believe Paul knew this. I believe Paul knew this. In fact, I think Paul learned this from the prophet Joel, the the ancient prophet Joel. In Joel 3.10, he says, Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak say, I am strong. In fact, I feel like this is a prophetic message. Even though it's at the end of the year, I feel like it's a prophetic utterance to the saints and to the believers and the church of Jesus Christ. That if you've been weary or weak or disappointed or even defeated in 2020, I feel the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord urging you to speak over your situation. Now you may see your situation one way. But if you want to speak something different, it's fascinating how what you speak changes the perspective and the orientation and the product or the fruit of what that situation will bear in your life. It's not based on the way you see it. It's based on the way you speak over it. What you speak to come forth. Your strength is evident through what I've endured, not what I've avoided. That's what Paul wanted to say to the haters. Your strength is evident by what you've endured, not what you've avoided. This is what he was saying when he would boast about his weaknesses. Paul is not sadistic, but he's saying all my weaknesses are a long list of things that I've endured and I'm still standing. You have avoided everything, so you haven't known hardship. So what could you stand upon? I'm standing on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every weakness in my life is a resume of what God's done and He is adding to it and He is adding to it. I wonder what your resume says after 2020. I wonder what weaknesses you've had to push through. You've had to stay through. You've had to speak through. I feel like I'm speaking to anyone who has been overwhelmed in this season. I'm 